my privilege to be here this morning. Um, Ellie and I have been here for about six months. And uh, just to, I want to just say to you as a church, you're really good at welcoming people. <laughs> Ellie and I walked through the door here, uh, I think at the end of August last year, and we walked into what felt to us like family. Honestly, the moment we walked in, the day we walked in, we thought, this is the place for us. We just knew it. And uh, I just want to encourage you, please keep looking out for visitors. Please keep looking out for people who are coming afresh. Because not everybody is familiar with church environment. And uh, just continue being kind of gracious and loving and caring and approaching people. Because it makes a huge difference. For me, it was really key for us when we walked in on that first Sunday. The people just warmly welcomed us. So thank you for that. Really appreciate that. And uh, the other thing, just to endorse what Jeff said, last Sunday evening at the Face Down event, if you weren't there, honestly, it was stupendous. It was superb. Somebody brought me a prophetic word at the end of the meeting, which has just been living in me this week. It's absolutely shaped my week. My wife and I have had a bonkers week. I don't know what your week's been like. Uh, on Wednesday, we completed on our house purchase which is something which we felt God promised to us numbers of years ago. And then last year, part of our move down to this area was, was fulfilled this week as we completed on the purchase of a house. And uh, yesterday, uh, I was over at our old place we were renting and filling up removals vans with some removals people, kind of generally panicking about the amount of turk we got. And amazingly, they got it all in, bar about three or four boxes. I cannot believe they've done it. But yesterday it felt like fulfilment as well of something of what God's called us to do as a couple and as our, in our wider family. So it's been a bonkers week. It's been an absolutely bonkers week. And for me, I'll come on to part of the bonkersness of it in a minute. But um, I've just, no, I've lived with a prophetic word this week. Hey, and it's about not striving for me. If I'm not striving, just know God is with you. And it's absolutely shaped my will. So uh, I'm going to be speaking on a heart for the single. Hopefully the PowerPoint will come up behind. And um, I want to try and give out some kind of biblical framework for the season or seasons of singleness. And um, it can be a hugely emotive topic. I recognise a lot of people will come with lots of baggage, lots of questions, lots of hurt possibly this morning. So it can be a very emotive topic. And uh, if you are married, that doesn't mean you can switch off. Okay, I guarantee there's stuff in here for you this morning. So the first thing I want to do is just give you my brief uh, testimony. And um, I was actually married just after my 25th birthday. I had recently come to faith in Christ as a 24-year-old. And uh, this is me. I had hair once. Look at that. <laughs> On the left-hand side. So that was me on my wedding day back in July 1993, as a fresh-faced 25-year-old. And the lady who I was marrying, called Karina, she was somebody that I had uh, worked with, and uh, we got along really, really well as friends. She was a Christian, I wasn't. I came to faith, I proposed to her, she said yes. And uh, there's a lot more story there, but I haven't got time for it really this morning. And not only did my life change, when Christ came into my life, and my life did radically change, but then I got my girl, and I'm really pleased. No longer was I single. I was really pleased to be out of the single season. And uh, soon after that, a couple of years after that, our first child came along. We had three children, Esther, Ben, and Lydia. They were born between 96 and 2000. And um, life seemed pretty good. But you'll know, when I talk about Karina, I talk about her in the past tense. On the 12th of February, and this is the other bonkers part of my week, nine, uh, 2010, Karina went to glory. As best as I can understand it, she walked into her eternal home. And uh, I was left with our three children. Uh, they were 13, 11, and 10 when their mum died. My youngest daughter, Olivia, had her 10th birthday in the hospice where Karina was dying. And uh, we had a huge, huge kind of raft of emotions, as you can imagine, around all of that. And so this week has been the ninth year since Karina went 
to be with Jesus, to her final home, as best as I can understand it. I was now widowed. I was now single again. I haven't wanted to be single again. That was never in our plan. Not only was I single again, I was now a single parent. I never wanted to be a single parent. As you can imagine. Sometime later, I met and married the very delightful Ellie, and she'll be speaking to us in a little while, just telling us something about her journey, which I think will be really helpful for everybody. And uh, I inherited, I adopted, I became stepfather to two more children. So if you talk a bit to me about my family, I'll say I have five children. I do have five children. I'm the father of five. Ellie also had been widowed, and that was our kind of common ground when we first spoke. And uh, so Ellie and I have been in a season of life that we hadn't wanted to be in for a significant period of time. Ellie far longer than I. And so this morning, you may come in a season of life you really don't want to be in. You may be that this morning you come as a single person and you're happy, and that's fabulous. God bless you, that's good. <coughs> Maybe you come this morning, you're single, you deeply like to be married. You deeply like to find your life partner. And I understand that could be some people's position this morning. You may come as a widow or a widower, you know, I'm actually back in that sin on a season. That's a tough time. You may feel lost, bewildered, struggling. That's a tough, tough time. And maybe in a congregation this size, that you're suffering, not suffering, that is totally the wrong word, that you are somebody who struggles with same-sex attraction. And I'll be surprised if in a congregation this size, there aren't personal persons who struggle with that, and that's an issue. Listen, whatever and however you come this morning, we've declared it in song this morning, can I just say this, that Jesus loves you. He is for you. We sang it in, as Millie led us this morning. What this, the words of the song, I'm not forsaken. You have chosen me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm frantically writing down the words thinking, oh, isn't this wonderful? This is glorious truth we're declaring. However you come this morning, before anything else, you must know you are a child of God. If you're a Christian here today, if you've put your trust in Jesus, it's so key that we come empty-handed, that we come and we say, God, come and fill me. I am yours. However you come today, know this before anything else, that you're a child of God. Jesus came to die, not just for your sin, and he did, and that was wonderful, but he came to give you life. And life, as the Bible says, in all of its fullness. And that is key for us this morning. So there are some... Uh, so this is... The middle photo here is me and my children after I've been with them. So this was on a holiday I tried to do with them uh, on a boat, which was great. And this here is Ellie and I getting married with our five children. Seasons of life. You may be in a season this morning you'd rather not be in. But Jesus is with us. If you're a Christian here today, Jesus is with you. If you're not a believer this morning, you come saying, what is this, Jesus? What is this about? Listen, God can transform your life. I think Vic said it. God can transform your life. He can turn things around in your life. And you can know God with you in everything. But there are some challenges of living a single life. I think I've experienced some of those. We can have the next slide, that'd be fun. Uh, loneliness could be a significant challenge for the single person. Because we were people to be, who were supposed to live in community. That's how God made us. And uh, right back at the beginning at creation, he made us to be a people living in community. And if you don't get your intimacy from a married relationship, and you don't get it from close personal friendships, and actually you can just end up being very lonely. It can be very challenging for a single person. Another challenge of being single could be uh, lack of accountability. I know when I was married to Karina, she was very good at picking me up on when I kind of got things wrong and had a really bad attitude. And when the children were young, it's really, really hard and you're tired and all of those things are going on. And as a single person, you can not have that kind of close level of accountability. And that can feel quite hard sometimes. Navigating social occasions can be really tricky as a single person. You might find that feels really awkward. A lot of stuff seems to revolve around married people. That can feel difficult. Sexual expression. In our Western culture, 
It seems like sexual self-expression can be a God in itself. How many people do you know you could genuinely say they believe that you can live a fulfilling life as a single celibate person without any sexual expression? How many people do you know? In our Western culture, feels like that feels a bit awkward. But actually, it's God's people. We need to have a robust view of celibate singleness. Not just as a transition to married life, but actually as a life choice. And I have a, we have a couple of friends who have made that life choice to stay single and as celibate single people. And that's a good thing, and that's okay. But that can be a challenge. There are some benefits too of being a single, for sure. You can have a relatively large amount of time, which you can uh, invest in however you want to. You can enjoy a broad range of friendships, which as a, uh, as a married person, sometimes you can't in the same way. When my wife died, back in 2010, it was my dear friend who was single, age 36, who came to my house every night for three months and sat with me. And we played silly games and we chatted. And he listened to me. I cried a lot. But you know, it was Tim, my mate Tim, three months, every day he turned up. Why? Because he was single, he was willing, he's full of love, he had the time to do it. So there could be some great benefits from, from the single life. But what does the Bible say about singleness? In uh, Genesis, the Bible teaches us that God, God blessed Adam and Eve, and he told them to scatter across the face of the earth and to fill it with families that reflect the image of God through the life-giving sexual union of marriage. And when Jesus came, he kind of introduced a new order. He kind of turned things around a little bit. And he came not to scatter, but he came to gather one family. He came to gather a people from a, across the world for himself. And one family in which eventually no one would be paired off in marriage. But all would be like brothers and sisters living together in community. So Luke 20, <coughs> verse 34, Jesus says this. The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. So it's like we live kind of between two worlds. Earthly marriages and families can reflect a wonderful echo of God's eternal family, and they should be encouraged, of, of course, and defended, of course. But one day, they will pass away. Karina, when she walked into glory on the 12th of February, 2010, she walked in as a single woman, as best as I can understand the scripture. And after, uh, after Karina's funeral, which was on March the 4th of that year, I remember going home and thinking, I had Ben Davis's words ringing in my ears from stuff he'd said to me in the past. Mate, he's a Welshman, right? I don't do a very good Welsh accent. Mate, you've got to live in reality. Right? And, and I just thought, oh, I'm like, this is awful. And I took my wedding ring off because I felt I've got to live in reality. Korea walks into glory as a, as a single, as a married person, but arrived in glory as a single person. And that is the eternal perspective that Jesus brought, that one day we would all be uh, with him, essentially in the resurrection of the dead, neither married nor given in marriage. What else does the Bible say about singleness? When 2 Peter 1, 3, the scripture says that uh, God has given us everything we need, everything we need for life and godliness. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own goodness and glory, it says. But God, he has given us everything we need. Not that a marriage partner would give us everything we need, but God has given us everything we need. And then in Psalm 16, verse 11, it doesn't say that in marriage there is fullness of joy. What it does say is that in God there is fullness of joy. In him there is fullness of joy. And uh, in the New Testament, both... Jesus and the Apostle Paul in the writings of the New Testament are very clear that those who choose to live a life of celibate singleness to God, that it's a good thing. So uh, in Matthew 19 verse 12, Jesus specifically talks about those who choose to live their life as a celibate single person. 
And then 1 Corinthians 7 verse 8, it says, Paul writing, to the unmarried and the widows, I say it's good for them to remain single. So in terms of the scripture, it's really clear. It's a good thing to be single. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And then 1 Corinthians 7 32, it talks about more time for serving God if you're single and not married. And let's just always remember, when we talk about God's heart for the single, and think about that, that Jesus was a single man. He was the most fulfilled, the most complete, the most satisfied, the most wonderful person in all of history. So as Christians, we're always going to be looking at what does the Bible teach in terms of our ultimate authority. So what did Jesus say about singleness? How did he breach the topic or broach the topic of waiting to be married? Did he say anything to unhappy single people? The truth is Jesus, his interactions with those he met, didn't usually focus on their marital status. He focused more on uh, not whether they were married, widowed, divorced, or anything else. He was interested really in their faith, in their attitude to sin, in their love of God, in their love for others. Those were the things that Jesus kind of specifically spoke about. And uh, the wonderful thing about Jesus is that he befriended married and single alike and commissioned married and single alike. He didn't discount anyone because they were single. And in their culture, it was very hard to be a single person, particularly if you were a woman. But Jesus didn't discount anybody. In our culture, our marital status can be seen as part of our identity. This morning, I walked around in the field outside our house, just thanking God for all that he's done this week, praying for this morning. And uh, I met my neighbor, a lady called Angela. And um, and I introduced myself to her, saying, oh, I'm Craig, really good to meet you, great, uh, we just moved in. I'm married to Ellie. She, Ellie wasn't there at the time. I thought, that's, that's what we do, isn't it? Part of our identity, how we talk about ourselves often, is in our marital status. But uh, our marital status is not the key question. Our identity is going to be based not on whether we're married or single, widowed or divorced, but our identity, as we've already spoken about this morning, is based on a person. It's based on Christ. It's based on what Jesus has done through his death, his life, his resurrection. That's where our identity is. That's what gives us security. That's what gives us significance. And it's what gives us our acceptance. The truth is that the Bible doesn't elevate the gift of marriage above the gift of singleness. And that if you're single here this morning, it's really key. Because I think you need to hear that. And we need to respect and honour that. God sees them as an equal value, and so should we. Our value and worth, in other words, is not in our marital status, but it's in a person. It's not in whether we're married, it's in Jesus. And church life can often focus, the way it does stuff, on marriage and on family. And um, if we're not careful, we can be really, really in danger. In the absence of a vision for the single, celibate lifestyle... And we can end up developing churches which are just, marriage is just the norm. I mean, it's just how it is. And actually, I don't see that in the scripture. Most people will probably get married, but not all. And a single servant lifestyle needs to be something which is honoured and accepted and spoken about as equal in value to the married life. So marriage is not a goal to be reached. It's not a prize to attain. And it's certainly not something that's going to fix all our problems. If you're married here, you'll know that's true. <laughs> married life doesn't fix all your problems. It just doesn't, does it? No. You're right. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28, actually says that. And if, we're very, if we aren't very careful, we can see celib- uh, singleness as a phase to be kind of just worked through, trying to get out of... Uh, moved out as quickly as possible. Sometimes people think of it even as being having to endure or suffered. And I think, I don't see that that's the scriptural perspective. But it is okay to want to be married. That's a good and honourable thing too. I want to read you a story of, uh, of a lady called Cara. It's probably on the next slide, I'm guessing. 
marriage, gift of marriage, gift of singleness, equal value. Kara's story. This is a single lady in her 20s, then 30s, then 40s. And I read this in a book recently, and I just thought it was magnificent because it summarizes what I'm trying to say here. She said this, in my early 30s, I hit a real low. I'd run out of patience with being single. And if I'm honest, I was angry with God. When she was crying and she was pouring out her heart to God, she then said this, God interrupted me, speaking over my voice and over my tears, and what he said to me will stay with me forever. Very clearly, he said, Cara, I want you to stop waiting and start living. I know my focus needed to shift. I needed to live in the good of what Jesus had done for me. Jesus came and gave his life for me so that I would have life in all of its fullness. I realized that the enemy had been using my discontentment with being single to limit my expectation of what God might do in and through me. I can't say that in the years since then, my life has been easy, nor have I found the quick fix for how to balance lasting contentment in my singleness with my deep desire to be married. But what happened that day was a change in my heart that began a gradual process where I allowed God to teach me how to live my life to the full as he has planned. And she said this, and I just thought it's magnificent. What a great vision for your life. I now live my life believing I'm single because it's God's absolute best for me, regardless of whether I'm single for another year, 10 years, or for the rest of my life. Jesus paid a high price for my life. And it shouldn't be wasted. Wasted. And she finishes with this. I just want to read it all because I just felt there's such truth in it. It's fabulous. By God's grace, she wrote, rather than begrudging my singleness, I have learned to give my singleness to him and ask him to use it for his glory. I am determined to make my single years count for his kingdom. I now love the freedom that being single gives me. I can go anywhere and do anything for God, free from the concerns, ties, and commitments that my married friends have. My relationship with Jesus is so precious me, to me, and listen to this, and I love that it is just me and him. He is jealous for me and chooses to have me all to himself at this time. It's a great vision as a single person for your life, isn't it? It's a magnificent vision that actually in her deepest heart of hearts she wants to be married and God knows that and that's okay but to have in the midst of all that saying you know what God however long it goes on for I just know you want to have me all to yourself for this time what a great thing fabulous thing life is very short part of my testimony is how short life it is Queen had died age 48 man I was expecting we were going to get into pensionable age together, you know, we'd see our children and grandchildren together. Hey, that didn't happen. I don't know how long life goes on for for each of us. But I know this, there's a date in the diary that we can't get away from. And so we need to live our lives with this full expectation that we're going to run this race marked out for us. Whether that's as a single person for a time or all of our lives, or whether it's as a married person, we need to run the race marked out for us. So if you're single here this morning, I want to say this to you, just to summarize what I've been trying to say. Your significance, your security and your acceptance are not found in a married partner. Okay, they're never going to be in your relationship stages. Actually, it's true whether, you're, whether or not you're single or whether or not you're married. Your significant security acceptance is never going to be found in your married partner. It's just not. It's to be found in one person, in one person alone. And it's in Jesus. It's in Christ Amen. where that is all to be found. And if you come this morning and you're not a believer, listen, God can transform your life in an instant. That's the Bible truth. He did it to me, age 24, sitting in the driveway of my house in my car. 
And I prayed a prayer and God transformed my life. And they think, man, I'm beyond hope. I'm beyond. God, you don't know what I've done. The things I've gone up to. The people I've betrayed and hurt. Listen, God can transform your life in an instant. That's the Bible truth. But if you're single here, please remember your significance, your security, your acceptance is not found in anybody but in Christ. And if you're married, it is the same. If you do, if you are single and you desire to be married, hey, that's a good thing, it's an okay thing. But don't let your search for a spouse be the one thing that defines you. Oh, I'll say it as gently as I can. You know, don't let it be, that's the one thing, that's the one thing, if only that will happen, then everything will be okay. Don't let it be something that defines you, even if it's your heart's desire. If you are single and hoping to be married, I would say this to you, it's based on what I can understand the scripture teaches, don't marry an unbeliever. And uh, if you are married to an unbeliever, you know there's huge challenges in that, and that can be really difficult in a marriage relationship. Um, when I came to faith, it was Karina who led me to the Lord. And uh, I actually had proposed to her as an unbeliever, because we just got on like a house on fire. She was just fat. You know, we, we laughed a lot, we just had great times together. But you know what? She was, she was a strong woman. But you know what? She was strong enough to say, no, I won't marry you. You're not a believer. I can do it. I can commit the rest of my life to that. And it just, I'm like, wow, really? Honestly, it's just like, wow. I, I, this is a girl I love. And I'm like, you really put the whole future on hold for that? But she was strong, you know? And uh, God bless her. It was the key thing which made me realize, this, coming to faith in Christ, is the big thing, isn't it? And soon after, I asked Jesus into my life. Whoa, my life's transformed. None of my family are Christians. I'm like, oh, wow. And I asked her to marry me a little while later. She said, yes, I'm like, yay. <laughs> but don't marry an unbeliever. I'm certain, but it's as gentle heart as I can. If you are single here and a Christian. And uh, finally, I'll say, if you are single, uh, just be honest with God. The story I read out from Cara is full of kind of her honesty. It said she was crying out to God. She's frustrated. I want to be, actually, my deepest desire is I want to be married. You know? Be honest with God. He knows anyway, but be honest with him. Be real. Pray. Seek him out. Ask for him to help you in the single years, however long they last for. And if you're single, I would say this, see your singleness as a gift from your Father in heaven who loves you and cares about you and is for you. See it as a gift from him. You're a child of his, you are gathered into his family. And you are key and he loves you very much. And uh, commit yourself to others. You do have a unique role. My friend Tim, I say, he came around to my house when Karina died. He had the availability, he really did. He had the time, he had the love in his heart. And as a single person, you do have a lot more opportunity to do really good stuff with your time, to serve God, to serve his kingdom, to serve his people, his family. And it may not be what you want ultimately, but I would say to you, hey, do. Spend time, give yourself to kind of ministries that maybe married people can't do quite so well, or quite so easily, or don't have the time for. And live the race marked out for you. I want to, I'm gonna ask my beautiful wife, Ellie, to come up and talk about, just briefly, a little testimony about kind of unique contribution of married people in the life of single people. So, Ellie, would you want to come up? Come here. Yeah. Is it on? It's on. Not that tall. Put that down. Yeah? <laughs> Very polished. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Psalm sixty-eight says, "God sets the lonely in families." 
My first husband died suddenly, aged 28. I was 28 too. Leaving me on my own with my two-year-old son Barnaby and my 11-month-old daughter Lucy. It was two weeks before her first birthday. I very much needed the comfort and security of being set in a family. It was a very tough journey, but the love of some wonderful Christian friends was a great comfort to me as both a single person and a single mum. There were two families who would regularly have me and my two very young children to stay for weekends or sometimes longer once it was three weeks. These were times when it felt like we'd become an integral, integral part of their family. We even got taken on holiday to centre parts as one family very lovingly shared their own special family time with us. I even got to go out for a spa evening with my friend while her husband looked after all the children, there were a lot of them then, and they had a fabulous time playing Cluedo. One particular event has always stood out in my mind. It was my birthday, and Barnaby and Lucy were then about five and six years old. I was working part-time as a primary school teacher, and life was really hard. Birthdays, when you're a single adult, can be very painful. There is no one to organise any presents or special activities for you, and it can be a very lonely experience. On this particular birthday, my two friends, Dave and Debs, came over to our house after school. We all went to the park and played some games together, and the children then enjoyed a picnic tea, which Debs had organised. We came back home, and Dave and Debs helped with bath time, story time, and putting two very happy children to bed. They then ordered a takeaway, and I had some much needed adult company for the evening. But the best part was yet to come. Just as they left for home, Debs handed me a carrier bag with my packed lunch in it, ready to take to work the next day. So much love and thought and empathy had gone into that. She foresaw the empty feeling I would have when I was left alone in the house to prepare for the next day. And as I ate my lunch in the staff room the following day, I knew I was loved. Loved enough for a friend to choose to see into my world and to work out how to make a difficult day so much better. That kind of love is what I, as a single person, needed. Dave and Debs truly showed me God's love and heart for me and have continued to do so to this day. Fabulous, isn't it? small. <laughs> it's good to hear, isn't it? You know, I talk, trying to talk about single people and having a vision for your singleness. You know, it's a gift of singleness. And actually, marry people. We can have a, a key role in the life of folks who are single. And that's really important for us. If you're married here today, your significance your security, your acceptance is in Jesus, not in your spouse. And your marriage is a gift from your Father in heaven. You may not feel like your marriage is a gift from your Father in heaven. <laughs> all seriousness, all joking aside, you may not feel, you may be struggling actually in your married life. You may think, hey, you've got significant issues going on. But let me say that your marriage is a gift from your Father in heaven who loves you who loves you deeply. If you are married, please love single people. Please listen to their hearts. Please love them for who they are. And please don't assume that marriage is the ultimate destination for every, every single person. That is not necessarily the case. We have a dear friend who's chosen to live her life as a celibate, celibate single woman. And uh, she has served God incredibly in her life. And if you spoke to her, you, she's really, really full-on flamboyant, loves Jesus, doesn't care, who care, who knows. She's magnificent. And has spent her life really giving herself to serving people actually all around the world. And she felt she could do that as a single person. Her name's Sheila. She's wonderful. She's like in her 60s now? Late 60s? 
70 maybe. She's a magnificent one. She, she's, that's what she's chosen to do. It's brilliant. Don't assume marriage is the final destination for everybody. It isn't necessarily. And uh, I would say this, extend your family. If you're married his day, why not extend your family? Ellie's testimony there is, is great truth about people who just opened up their world to her and just showed the love of God to her as a single mum in her case. Why not extend your family? Open up your home, open up your world, open up the gates of your family to other people who are single. Because we all need warm human relationships. That's the truth. And uh, we can be part of something much bigger, the family of God gathered together, being expressed through families to single people. So if you're married, remember that. And finally, if you're married, I would say, beware of social events which rely on couples. Okay, there's lots of those kind of things that go on in church life as well as out in the secular world. Okay, just beware, just be conscious of the single people. That could be really hard. How can I include them? How can I be part of helping them in this? Shall we pray?